We're just so glad you've chosen to worship with us on this very special September Sabbath. School is now fully underway, so this is kind of one of the first big Sabbaths after school has all come together. And we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Anonymous, God's Unnamed Disciples and the Difference They Made. And you may be asking, you know, who am I? What difference can I make? Well, this sermon series is going to talk right into that. So we're really glad you're here. Some other announcements. We've been sharing it for several weeks now. Divorce Care has already started, but it's designed where you can join at any time. And we really encourage, maybe you've been thinking about it, or maybe you know someone that could really benefit. We really encourage you to check it out. You can go to our website for the information. It happens at 7 p.m. on Tuesday evenings in the ministry building, room 1402. Also, Rules of Engagement is just around the corner. It starts Friday, October 4. This is for couples that are seriously dating, maybe they're engaged already. It's a really helpful seminar. It starts 6.30, there's a meal, and then the seminar starts at 7, and this also is in room 1402. It's on Friday evenings, and the first one starts October 4. Our next announcement, we'd love to have you put on your calendar. It's coming October 12 at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. It's the Association of Adventist Women have a special Vespers. The featured speaker is Elizabeth Talbot. She's gonna talk about her journey with Jesus. That's right here in the sanctuary at 5 p.m. Encourage you to put that on your calendar. Also with school coming back, our young adult ministry, Praxis, has a lot of events planned. It's like movie night, there's some things on Sunday. There's all kinds of things going on this weekend. If you're interested, go to our website, check out Praxis, and you can find out all the great things they're doing to welcome the students back. Well, that's our announcements for today. For the latest information, go to our website, louc.org, and we really hope you have a wonderful and blessed Sabbath day.
morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Loma Linda University Church service. We're so happy to see each one of you here this morning. How many of you are happy this morning? All right. Everyone is happy. I didn't see one or two hands go up, but we'll talk to them a little later. We'll make them happy. Well, we welcome you once again to our Loma Linda University Church service. So happy that you've chosen to come to worship Almighty God this morning here in this church. I understand that we have university, Loma Linda University students and other students from possibly other universities here this morning, and we welcome you. Uh, I understand our university has started classes, so we welcome you students to our Loma Linda University worship service and our Loma Linda University campus. I know we have many individuals watching through LLBN, and we want to welcome you folks this morning as well. Whether, you're here in per whether you are here in person or watching through LLBN or other uh, social media uh, means we welcome you folks as well. We know that you will be blessed this morning through the service that we have planned for you. How many of you are happy to see our Loma Linda University Church Orchestra and Choir here this morning? I tell you, every time I hear the choir and the orchestra, it is a rich, rich blessing. So welcome to all. Welcome to worship here at our Loma Linda University Church. Let us all stand as we sing our hymn of praise this morning.
Let us pray. Our good and gracious God, what a privilege it is to worship you together this morning, to hear the songs of praise, to ring them out to you, ascribing you the glory, the power, and the adoration that only you deserve. Despite the challenges we face, it is a privilege to be able to see you and to be reminded that you are still the ruler of all of nature and the God over all of us. We live in a world that is indescribably marred by hatred, violence, and war. Where the sickness of our hearts and our minds and our bodies threaten to break our lives apart. And yet, Somehow, almost miraculously, the darkness of this world does not diminish the brightness of your glory. Those of us who follow you have witnessed how sometimes our deepest, darkest moments only serve to help us to more clearly see your light. And so this morning, we turn our eyes to your glory and we plead for your goodness. We ask for healing, for forgiveness, for wholeness. We ask that you reconcile our relationships and that you repair our broken bodies, knowing that you are a good enough, great enough God to hold us in your capable hands is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I have found in my life there are two types of dollars in my world. First, the dollar that serves me. You know, mortgage, food, cable, all the essentials. <laughs> and then there's the dollar that serves the Lord in his kingdom. And he talks to me a lot about which dollar has priority. And, and we argue sometimes, and he reminds me those dollars are mine, Doug, but I want to support you and your family, but won't you remember me in the kingdom? And I found that the dollar that I spend at church serves both worlds. It advances the kingdom of God, and yet I benefit. Amen? I choose a ministry that I appreciate or that I want to support, the music ministry, the children's ministry, outreach ministry, our new campaign uh, project, the new family ministries building. Here's one that you might not be reminded of, Worthy Student Fund. As a youth pastor, I sit on a committee that takes your donated dollars and we advance Christian education in serving worthy students. This is an amazing journey that this church is on. Please know that it is not typical nor is it routine. We are advancing the kingdom of God with your offering and tithe. We thank you for being faithful, and we thank you for being a part of the advancement of God's kingdom. May God bless you as you decide to spend your kingdom dollar.
Good morning, church family. It is so awesome to see all of you. My name, if you don't know who I am, is Philip Milo Savlovich. I was gone for the last three months. That's why you haven't seen me. I was on a sabbatical. So traveling around with my wife and three kids, we had such a wonderful summer. But I'm not up here alone. Good morning, church. My name is Kelly Lynn Dickinson, and I'm the young adult intern pastor with Praxis. I've been here for the last three years working with Pastor Phil, and it's been such an honor to serve our young adult community. I am currently studying my master's in pastoral ministry, and I'm married to my amazing husband, Logan Dickinson, and we get to do ministry together. That is so awesome. Well, we are going to be sharing with you just briefly a little ministry highlight about young adult ministry. You know, young adults are a u unique age group. It is technically from 18 to 
29, but we've kind of extended it a little bit in our church, about 35 in the ministry that we get to shepherd. And it's really a season of transitions, transition from home to university, transition from one job to another, transition from singleness maybe to a relationship or just the journey to get married or how that goes and navigating the challenges along the way. And our ministry is really here to not only be a support to them, but also to foster a beautiful sense of community as they go from one transition to another. I want to start off by saying something about the five pillars of our ministry, the five kind of modalities that really make Praxis what it is. And it first starts with Night Church. Night Church is an incredible worship experience every single Friday night right here in our family ministries building. Last night was the welcome back weekend. We had over 350 young adults, an amazing time. We had so much fun together. There's a beautiful worship service. There is a a sermon that either happens by myself or our elders. So it's young adults speaking to young adults. And then right after that, we have something called the afterglow, which is kind of a time for young adults to really get into conversations. We'll have some refreshments. And so last night we were here until almost midnight. So it is uh, quite the time. So that's one element of Praxis. Yes. And our uh, second element is life groups. Life groups are uh, small groups of 12 to 15 people who gather together. And we have our life groups launch three times a year, one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall. And so we are actually launching our new life group season this fall. And we have 16 small groups of young adults who chose to be leaders, chose to also pick their topic of what they wanted to study. So sometimes it's a book, sometimes it's a Bible, it's the Bible, sometimes it is um, an activity that they like to do together. And so one of the activities that we have that goes year round is our running group. And so it's a way for our young adults to meet outside of the four walls of our church and gather organically and get to know each other. And we truly believe that this is how our ministry grows. Mm -hmm. is the heartbeat of our community is gathering together just like the first church did in Acts. And so it is such a blessing to see all of our young adults excited and passionate to lead and to grow in their life groups and to meet outside of the church. And now we have our launch right now as we speak. And so if you're a young adult and you'd like to be part of one of those life groups, you can go on to our Instagram, Praxis Ministry, or our church website, and from there you can click Young Adults, or just go directly to our website, praxisministry.org. Now, a beautiful thing that happens today, every Sabbath morning, is Sabbath school. Our young adult ministry has a Bible study experience that happens at 10 a.m. in the basement of the Family Ministries building. Young adults come with questions. It's a season of questions, starting in high school and then really moving into the college and early kind of 20s and mid-20s. They're asking questions about faith. And I think the reason why we have found so much, I would say, success in, in just fostering faith is because we open up that time for any question. Time of just exploring and discovering. We'll study the Sabbath school lessons sometimes, other topics. It's just really a beautiful spot where our elder team and others are teaching in our young adult space. Absolutely. We always say there is no wrong question. Um, Sometimes wrong answers. Just (laughs) kidding. Um, But yes, Sabbath school is an amazing space for us to continue to delve into those questions that we might be having. Our fourth pillar are our socials, and that is a space where we invite all young adults from all walks of life. You will notice that at our socials, we'll have different groups of people who maybe don't come to Sabbath school, who maybe don't even come to our night church program, but they have a friend who wants them to come to the beach with them. They have a friend who wants to join them for the Friendsgiving or the Christmas banquet. And each year, we do a Praxis retreat where we go away and we retreat and we grow together as a community. And we've had over 100 young adults come out for these events, and it is so fun to see everyone interacting getting to know each other outside of the church as well. Yeah, absolutely. And now the fun doesn't stop this weekend in particular. Tonight, we want to invite anyone who's a young adult 
So the young at heart are not invited either. Uh, but the young adults, 18 to 35, we have a movie night tonight. It's going to be outside in the amphitheater out here. Uh, we're going to be watching a film, something about inside, outside, and the second it's one. It's something to do with emotions, uh -huh. so it'll be really good. Yeah. We'll have a little Vespers starting around uh, kind of 6 for dinner, and then Vespers around 6.30, and then we'll start our film around 7.00. And our Wednesdays at Lucy's team will be providing our dinner tonight. And so thank you if you are on that team. We love you guys. And then on Sunday, we have an event called Sports Day. Mm -hmm. And Sports Day is a collaboration with our Rooted Ministry, which are our Young Professionals Ministry. So we'll be meeting at Redlands University on Sunday morning from 8 to 11 a.m. And we'll be posting the exact location on our Instagram at Praxis Ministry. And so we hope that if you are a young adult, that you stop by any one of our events, any one of our pillars of our ministry, and we hope that we get to meet you, get mm -hmm. to have a conversation with you, and we just want to get to know you as yeah. friends and as uh, people of our church. Amen. And friends, community happens when one or two are gathered, and the Bible says that Jesus is there. And so as we gather together here on this Sabbath morning, you'll feel the experience of Christ. But also, if you're a young adult, I hope that you would take that moment to say, you know what, I don't want to walk in isolation during this journey of my life. I want to be here together. So God bless you. Thank you so much for letting us share about Praxis Ministry with you.
Good morning, church. Our uh, scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verses 1 through 14. Joab, son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. He said to her, pretend you are in mourning. Dress in mourning clothes and do not use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor. And she said, Help me, your majesty. The king asked her, What is troubling you? I am a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field, and, and no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant. They say, hand over the one who struck his brother down, so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. Then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant on the face of the earth. Go home, and I will issue an order in your behalf. Let my lord the king pardon me and my family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. If anyone says anything to you, bring them to me, and they will not bother you again. Then... Let the king invoke the Lord his God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son will not be destroyed. As surely as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. Let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak. Why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son? Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. Good morning. It's good to see you all again. Where have you been? <laughs> Today we begin a series entitled Anonymous, God's Unnamed Disciples and the Difference They Made. Being anonymous can at times be a source of difficulty, of estrangement, of loneliness, and pain. But being anonymous is not always a bad thing. A couple of stories that I've liked over the years point that out. One of them is of an older woman who came to a worship service, probably not unlike this one. The deacon met her at the door and said, I'll, I'll take you to a seat. It's rather full, but I'll, I'll usher you to your seat. Where would you like to sit? She said, I want to sit on the front row. He said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. She said, that's where I want to sit, the front row. He said, it's not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? He said, it's our pastor. He's very boring. You're liable to get up there and fall asleep. It'll be very embarrassing. She said, do you know who I am? He said, no. She said, I'm the pastor's mother. <laughs> he looked horrified and said, do you know who I am? She said, no. And he said, good, and disappeared into the crowd. <laughs> Sometimes being anonymous is not a bad thing. Or how about the classroom in the large public university? One of those classes where there are so many students, the professor has no idea as to their names. They're just numbers to him, numbers on a page, or these days, numbers on a screen. 
It was final exam time, an essay exam. They had two hours to write. Their professor was very clear in his instructions. I've given you exam booklets. You have two hours to write. I'll give you notices with 15, 10, and 5 minutes left. I will accept no late papers, period. They furiously begin to write. 15, 10, 5, turn in your papers. And they rose, and everybody came and made a large stack on the professor's desk, except for one young man who stayed right about there and just kept writing and writing. At first, the professor was going to grab the stack and walk out of the room, but then he was intrigued about this young man who so openly defied his instructions. So he waited. Five, ten, fifteen minutes. He finally finished, got up, stretched a bit, looked quickly at his paper, got his backpack, came up, and started to lay his exam down on the top of the stack. And the professor said, what do you think you're doing? He said, I'm turning in my exam. My instructions were clear. I will not accept your exam. The student looked at first offended, shocked. He said, do you know who I am? The professor said, I neither know nor care who you are. Student said, well, good. Picked up about half the papers, dropped his in the middle, dropped it out, (laughs) and walked on out of the classroom. Sometimes it's good to be anonymous. But that is not always the case. Sometimes it's painful. It's painful to feel like I am just one in a long, endless list of names and faces. That I make no difference. I saw a cartoon one day that showed two penguins looking out over a sea of identical-looking penguins. And one turns to the other and says, you know what we need around here? What we need around here are some name tags. (laughs) Well, maybe you felt that way. Just anonymous, just a face in the crowd. Make no difference. Today's the first Sabbath of the official school year. I know there are programs going on all the time at LLU. But this is the first official Sabbath of the school year. So students are arriving, new students, returning students. It's easy to feel like just one in a list of names, a sea of faces. I'm just one in a class. This class is just one in a program. This program is just one in a school. This school is just one in a university. This university has produced tens of thousands of graduates. Who am I? Anonymous. Or it's easy to approach the other end of life and think, what have I accomplished? What have I done? What will be of lasting value? Have I left any legacy? Have I made any imprint? Have I accomplished something that will make a difference? Or am I doomed to be one of those whose epitaph could easily read, known by few, loved by less, forgotten by all? Anonymous. Well, if you've ever had any of those feelings, those sentiments, then this series that we step into today is for you. For any of us who have known, even if we were to have our 15 minutes of fame, soon we would disappear into the mists of time and be utterly forgotten. Because in this series, we're going to step into a few stories of some unnamed, faceless, anonymous personalities in Scripture who made a profound difference. To this day, we don't know their names. Sometimes their appearance is brief enough that if you blink, you'll miss it. And yet their legacy lives on. Today, we begin by stepping into just such a story. We step into the story of a woman, a woman whose name we don't know. We know where she's from. She's from a village, a hamlet called Tekoa. Almost unknown. An Old Testament prophet was born there, but other than that, very little is known about Tekoa. And yet this woman appears on the pages of Scripture in 2 Samuel 14 and stuns us with her wisdom and spiritual depth. So we have to have some of the setting 
if the story is to make sense. So a few brief brushstrokes to cover a great deal of territory. It's a very painful time in the life of King David. King David's rise had been almost meteoric. He had risen higher and higher, called a man after God's own heart, until he reached the pinnacle in 2 Samuel 11 and a woman named Bathsheba. And it all came crashing down around him. From there, the descent has been equally precipitous. It has showed itself in a number of ways. It has affected King David. It has affected his family. Some would argue it has affected his parenting because if any one word could be used to describe the parenting style of King David, it would be the word permissive. There are those students and scholars who argue that it was because of his cataclysmic collapse that David would feel later that he had no moral authority to guide his children. I don't know if that's the case, but it makes sense. And so his permissive style felt itself, made itself known in his family. And so he has a son, Amnon, falls in love with his sister, Tamar, half-sister. She spurns his advances. He overpowers her, forces himself on her, humiliates and shames her. Her brother, Absalom, also a fine human specimen, burns with rage, schemes and plots behind the scenes until he accomplishes the murder of Amnon as blood vengeance for what happened to his sister. And then he flees, stays gone for years. And it's right there that we join the story. We join the story with Joab, the commander-in-chief of David's armed forces, scheming and plotting. You recognize a pattern? Scheming and plotting a way to bring Absalom back home. We're going to read this time in the New Living Translation the story. But before reading, notice just a couple of things. Watch for them. First of all, that notice that this woman, This unnamed, faceless, anonymous woman is in a very precarious situation. She's a woman in her world and day, surrounded by very powerful men. Men who with the drop of a hand or a wink and a nod can end people's lives. She's caught in the swirling vortex of the interplay of deep and murderous emotions that have taken place between these men. And here she stands. So the first thing that must surely jump off the page is that she's a woman of courage. But there's a second thing to watch for. Our passage will describe her as a woman of great wisdom. Great wisdom. It's not frequently said of women in Scripture, and certainly not the Old Testament. It is said at times. But here we have a woman of courage, a woman of great wisdom, and there is one other attribute that I'm going to hold for just a few moments that is actually the one that I find the most stunning. So, we go to 2 Samuel. Chapter 14, reading from the NLT, New Living Translation, the story unfolds this way. Joab realized how much the king longed to see Absalom. So he sent for a woman from Tekoa who had a reputation for great wisdom. He said to her, Pretend you're in mourning. Wear mourning clothes and don't put on lotions. Act like a woman who's been in mourning for the dead for a long time. Then go to the king and tell him the story I'm about to tell you. Then Joab told her what to say. When the woman from Tekoa approached the king, she bowed with her face to the ground in deep respect and cried out, O king, help me. 
What's the trouble, the king asked. Alas, I'm a widow, she replied. My husband is dead. My two sons had a fight out in the field, and since no one was there to stop it, one of them was killed. Now the rest of the family is demanding, let us have your son. We will execute him for murdering his brother. He doesn't deserve to inherit his family's property. They want to extinguish the only coal I have left, and my husband's name and family will disappear from the face of the earth. Leave it to me, the king told her. Go home, and I'll see that no one touches him. Oh, thank you, my lord, the king. The woman from Tekoa replied, If you are criticized for helping me, let the blame fall on me and on my father's house, and let the king and his family be innocent. If anyone objects, the king said, Bring him to me. I can assure you he will never harm you again. Then she said, Please swear to me by the Lord your God that you won't let anyone take vengeance against my son. I want no more bloodshed. As surely as the Lord lives, he replied, not a hair on your son's head will be disturbed. Please allow me to ask one more thing of my Lord the king, she said. Go ahead and speak, he responded. She replied, Why don't you do as much for the people of God as you have promised to do for me. You have convicted yourself in making this decision because you have refused to bring home your own banished son. Hmm. All of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, He devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from Him. David's been through something like this before with a prophet named Nathan. You ought to be a bit wary of stories by this point in time. But you can understand why the woman is described as having great wisdom. She weaves her tail, leading him down the primrose path to self-judgment. You can see why she's called wise. She is trying to spare life. Let there be no more bloodshed. This is in a world of blood vengeance. This is in a world of the law of lex talionis, the law of retaliation. It grew out of Exodus and out of Leviticus, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a bruise for a bruise, a life for a life. Now, in fairness, in those contexts, it was intended to say, let the punishment fit the crime. Be just. Don't overpunish a life for a bruise, for example. But in practice, it seems that it had become merely a law of retaliation, of vengeance, of blood vengeance. So she's using that to draw him down the path where the story leads. Listen to words drawn from Old Testament scholar Bruce Birch, who writes this, David has been led by the woman's skillfully played role to compromise the law of blood vengeance. As Brueggemann has aptly stated it, when the killer is acknowledged to be a beloved son, vengeance can be overcome. The woman can now drop her ruse and reveal the true nature of the concern for which Joab sent her. It is a moment of risk and courage. One does not meddle lightly in the king's family matters. Her tone becomes deferential as she asks and receives permission to speak a word to the king. The intent of her speech is clear. If David can restore the son to the woman in her hypothetical case, then he can find a way to restore Absalom to his own family and kingdom. No wonder she's called wise. Now, you may say, but Joab, Joab is the one behind it all, giving her the content, true, but she stands with courage and weaves her tale as a master storyteller, convicting and convincing the king. But it's not that. 
that I find the most compelling for this nameless, faceless, anonymous woman. It's something else. Yes, she's a woman of courage. Yes, she's a woman of wisdom. But it's her spiritual depth, her spiritual insight, or if I could put it in what have long been Loma Linda terms, her insight into the character of God that I find most utterly compelling. Listen again to that last verse. This time I'll read it from the NIV. That last verse that we read, verse 14, she is speaking. Like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. She has enough insight into God that she says God is continually at work devising ways to find that person who has been banished and, and, and bring them back home. Or listen to it in the words of the contemporary English version. God doesn't take our lives. Instead, he figures out ways of bringing us back when we run away. Wow. What an insight into the character of God. At a time when blood vengeance was used to deal with these kinds of matters, when banishment was no small matter, in fact, Old Testament scholar Ronald Youngblood says simply this, it was commonly believed in ancient times that estrangement from God's presence was automatic and potentially permanent if a person was driven from his homeland. In other words, Absalom is gone because of his murderous fury. He's gone. Let bygones be bygones. Close the door. He's not coming back. He's been banished not only from our homeland, but from the very presence of God. And then stands a courageous, wise woman. In the midst of scheming, plotting men who have great power, who says, That's not God. Let there be no more bloodshed. That's not what God seeks. What God does, she says, is He sits on His throne in his high and holy eternity, devising ways to bring back the banished, to bring them home. She speaks to you, this woman. She speaks to you, parent. Parent who have... You have watched your children, your child, walk away from God. Want nothing more to do with anything to do with God. Through, finished, I don't want to hear about it. Has made choices that has them now circling the drain at a young age. Drugs, addiction, rage. Like the mother, true story. Like the mother whose husband found her in their late teenage son's room, one or two in the morning. He was thrown on the bed there just as he had come in, sweaty, dirty, hair mangled, but gone out of his mind on drugs. She sat there and wept and prayed and stroked his hair. Husband said, what are you doing? She said, it's the only time he'll let me love him. That woman speaks to that mom. She says, mother, God is devising ways, looking at his life, 
the interplay of situations and circumstances, relationships, people, and he's trying to find any way possible to bring the banished home. That's God. Speaks to you, spouse. Who've watched your own spouse walk away. Yes, there has been tragedy, wounded by a church institution, a death of a beloved friend in an untimely way. I don't want anything to do with that kind of God. And you just keep praying and wondering. That woman speaks to you. She says, God is devising ways to bring your spouse home. Student, your friend, you did service together. You studied theology together. You studied the Bible together. And now you, your friend wants nothing to do with God. And you pray, or is it you sing? Can you reach my friend? You're the only one who can. Lord, I know you love him. Help him understand. And this woman speaks and says, God is at work. He's devising ways to bring your friend home. That is what stuns me about this woman. Some 3,000 years ago she lived in a world very different than ours, with very few of even the spiritual advantages we enjoy, and yet with an understanding of God that is compelling. Remember, this woman never knew of a little town called Bethlehem and a baby that would be born there. She never knew of a teacher that would walk the dusty trails of Galilee and would speak of things like a waiting father and a wayward son. Never knew about his interaction with somebody called Zacchaeus about whom he would say, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save the one who was lost. She never knew. She would never read the words of, his, of, 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 of Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. She would never know of a little lane called the Via Dolorosa or the Nazarene rabbi who would stumble and stagger under the weight of the cross. She would never hear the words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. She would never see that figure nailed to that cross, cry out in triumph, it is finished, to tell us die. Her heart would never beat faster. Her eyes would never spring forth tears with the words, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. She had none of that. And yet, she could stand in a world which she had every reason to fear and with courage and wisdom, speak of a God that you have the privilege of knowing, that I have the privilege of knowing in a much deeper way. As she spoke to the king and to you and said, please understand God. God is devising ways to bring the estranged home. So what about it, your majesty? What will you say to that, King David? Same chapter, verse 18. I must know one thing. He has heard the story. He knows he has been convicted. I must know one thing, the king replied, and tell me the truth. Yes, my lord, the king, she replied. Did Joab put you up to this? 
And the woman replied, my Lord, the king, how can I deny it? Nobody can hide anything from you. Yes, Joab sent me and told me what to say. He did it to place the matter before you in a different light. But you are as wise as an angel of God, and you understand everything that happens among us. So the king sent for Joab and told him, All right, go and bring back the young man Absalom. You understand what has happened there? The king has realized that he is part of what God has devised to bring the estranged home. And you may be too. SDA Bible Commentary, David himself had grievously sinned and had stood in need of mercy. It was only because of the great mercy of heaven that he remained still alive and retained his throne. These words of the wise woman of Tekoa deeply touched the heart of David and moved him to mercy. I want to tell you a story. It's a story I've told before in this sanctuary from this platform. I told it at the funeral service of a friend. It's been years ago now. My friend had reached a point of such darkness that by his own hand his life had ended. And we were gathered. I heard the story, I believe, from Tony Campolo, the well-known Baptist preacher and sociologist. The story says that Peter and John, St. Peter and St. John in some traditions, according to the story, had been given the task of standing at the gates of glory and making sure that those who belonged got in and those who didn't, didn't. So they had a list. They were checking it twice, wanting to see who was naughty or nice. Every day there were those turned away and those invited in, and every evening at the dinner table they kept finding people they had explicitly turned away. How did you get in here? No one was talking. They redoubled their efforts. More care. No. Yes. There they were again. Days went by. So finally, a young man ran up to them and said, I know what's happening. I know how they're getting in. How are they getting in? The young man said, it's Jesus. He's pulling them over the back fence. <laughs> Just a story. I heard it, I think, from Tony Campolo. I wonder where he heard it, where he got it. Almost sounds like a wise woman from Tekoa and her view of God. After all, she was very good at spinning tales. Lord, probably every heart here today is heavy with a burden for an estranged child or spouse or friend. Lord, we want to be a part of what you devise to bring them home. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you all for joining us today. I know you agree with me that God provides us wonderful blessings at University Church, the preaching, the music, all the services. I am so grateful and you are too. More greetings now. Number one today, Vivienne Tamanaha, Loma Linda, 14th birthday, but see this sweet little girl. And then the darling 14 year old at Loma Linda Academy. Vicki LaPlante, Oceanside, California. 62nd birthday, Vicki. Congratulations on your birthday. Doris Cummings, Loma Linda, California, 99th birthday. See the lovely lady herself with son Leonard and granddaughter Gina, and then the whole beautiful family. Eunice Pearson, Candler, North Carolina. Hello, Eunice, happy birthday there with three children, and then with two sets of four generations. Eileen and David Gimmel, Anglin, California, marking 46th anniversary. You two are a beautiful couple wherever we see you. Priscilla Cole, Loma Linda, 78th birthday. All the best to you, dear lady. There with husband, Dr. Ed, and then your beautiful family, Sharon and Larry Gutman, Battleground, Washington, anniversary number 52. All the best to you as I see you on that happy day back when, and every day is a happy day. Colleen and Eric Laudenslugger, Loma Linda, 40th anniversary. Wow, on that special day, and here you are, and with your handsome boys and beautiful girls. Roger Hadley, Redlands, California, 72nd birthday, I think. Congratulations, Roger. There with Donna, and you're a dog lover too, on a recent trip to Norway. And then you and Donna recently marked your 48th anniversary. Yes, we love you too. Benji Ferguson, Pastor Benji. Sacramento, California, 49th birthday. Congratulations there with your wonderful family. And then with Mother Jan and Roger, Juanita and Eddie Hayner, Stafford, Virginia, 46th anniversary for you two. Here you are, and then with your family. Miguel Mendez, Pastor Miguel, right here, Loma Linda, with wife Linda, and then we see you with growing boys. And Linda's birthday is only a couple of days later, and so I see her joining you again. Sandy Schultz, Glendale, California. Hello, Sandy. Happy birthday there with dear Doug, and then with Doug's mother, Hazel, who is a centenarian. Willis Christian, La Center, Washington. Hello, Willis. Happy birthday, man. There with wife Lillian. Yes, we are Walla Walla College classmates. Audrey Ching Kim, Hawaii. Happy birthday, Audrey. In this picture there with the late husband, Howard. Audrey Graham, Stockton, California. Happy birthday. Always glad to be reminded, lady. And there with Pastor Ricardo. Joanne Lefevre. Redlands, California. Happy birthday, Joanne, there with grandson and then with husband, Beecher. Indra and Rob Matthews, McKinleyville, California. Yes, these two had birthdays last week and this week we mark their 35th anniversary. You were and here you are. Love you two. Amy and Keith Perrin, Phoenix, Arizona. 12th anniversary for you two. Yes, with your license in hand, and then a following delightful day. Tammy Dickinson Mitchell, Camarillo, California, 63rd birthday, Tammy. Proud grandmother you are, joined by Grandpa David, and then with your sons. Bucky Weeks, Hanford, California. Happy birthday, Bucky. There with wife Bonnie, and then three generations of Weekses about to depart on a trip. Doyleen Schlinker, Loma Linda, California. Hello, Doyleen, happy birthday. There with late husband, Willie. And then I see you with a grandson. 
John Paul Stafford, College Place, Washington. Hello, John. Happy birthday. Always glad to be in touch with you and dear Ruby wherever. Casey Casebolt, College Place, Washington. Hello, Casey. And a big happy birthday to you, man. There with Barbara and again with dear Barbara. Chauncey Smith, Simi Valley, California. Hello, Chauncey. There you are with Ruth, my former secretary, and then with your dear friend, Gwen. Peter Swelt, Haley, Idaho these days. There with daughter Carissa, and then at the piano, one of the favorite places I get to see you and hear you, Peter. And there with dear wife and your precious family. Christiana, Christy Lang, Livingston, Montana. Hello, Christy, happy birthday, lady. And there with daughter Kensington, Ted Jones, Grand Terrace, California, Pastor Ted. And you are a preacher for sure. And then with wife Esther. So good to be with you again. God bless you this week.